Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and emojis! Do you like using them on your computer? Do you like using them on your cell phone? I, ladies and gentlemen, do not play around with emojis. But I don't shame people that do, okay? Some people just like to share the pregnant man emoji, and you know what? I'm fine and dandy with that. But ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you emojis have the possibilities to hack you? And by possibilities, I mean very, very minute possibilities. Today's little uh, virus thing is a fun one, okay? Now, if you don't know, there's a convention known known as DEFCON that happens every year around August. This is something that's happened since 1993. It's a hacker convention where people come together to show all forms of new hacks that could absolutely grace the world of computing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know more about DEF CON, there's some pretty solid documentaries online. Hell, one day I might go through the whole history of it because there were some meme-tacular moments throughout the years, okay? Throughout the decades. But, of course, this last HackerCon came out that uh, there was something funny that you could do with emojis. Now, today's video is brought to you by researchers Hadrian Peral and George's Axel Jaloyan. I hope I pronounced everything right there. I know my last name gets pronounced pretty bad. Okay, a little anus accent. Action, if you will. So I apologize if I pronounce anybody's name wrong. But of course, they showcased a way to design RISC-V shell codes capable of running arbitrary code. Obviously, when we know running arbitrary code, we mean things can get real nasty. Now, they release this GitHub project over here, one that you can download, run within a QEMU simulator, an emulator, just for yourself to see how wild and wacky things can get. Now, of course, to understand, there's a few things we need to know. For those of you who are like, risk what? Risk five? Now, of course, when it comes to computers, there's something known as instruction set architectures. It's kind of the way processors interpret, or sorry, software interprets how to function on certain processors, okay? Now, ISAs come in multiple forms and fashions. For instance, if you're sitting on a gaming computer where you're on an AMD Ryzen processor like I am, or an Intel i7, i9, i5, i3, whatever, you're sitting on an x86 processor most likely, right? Now, of course, if you have a brand new MacBook, you're sitting on an ARM processor. In fact, most of your mobile devices are running on ARM processors. RISC-V is an open source processor that's kind of all the rage nowadays. It's starting to basically become a future project, especially for people who are creating, you know, newer systems, smaller people jumping into the hardware game that don't want to pay those nasty licensing fees. One day, it will be the architecture of the future, I hope. For now, a lot of people do use it, and it is gaining traction. Action. But that's just generally what you need to know for this project. Now, the next thing is shell code. For those of you who are wondering what shell code is, well, it's pretty simple. Shell code is basically code designed to launch a shell. For those of you who don't know what a shell is, think of it like every time I fire up this Linux command terminal or when you open up the command prompt on your Windows system. What you're doing is opening a shell. What you're effectively doing at that point is opening shells. The shell effectively allows you to control computers. Now where it gets really nefarious is if let's say somebody from the other side of the world hacks into your computer to spawn a shell, well, they can start to control nearly every aspect of your system. And depending on how high their privilege escalation goes, they can control nearly every single aspect of your system. Sometimes, hell, without you even knowing. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, shell code is basically code that's designed, again, to execute those shells. Now, in a very layman's term here, I'm going to describe just how these shell codes operate. They can be used to hit weak points on your software, on your hardware, to basically launch things like buffer overflows, take advantages of them, rather, or other vulnerabilities in your system. So I guess a very layman's explanation is kind of like this. Let's say that I gave you a set of instructions, right? I gave you a piece of paper and I wrote like, well, this is a napkin, but imagine on this napkin, I wrote uh, five instructions for you, for instance, right? One of those is get up, okay, get out of bed. Uh, second instruction is go to Walmart. Third instruction is go to the electronic section. Fourth instruction is ask the person at the electronic section just how many copies of Grand Theft Auto V are sitting on the shelf. And then your fifth instruction is come back to home and tell me how many copies exist. Now, you'll probably look at those instructions and say, okay, I got up, I went to Walmart, I went to the electronic section, and now I'm going to ask the guy working there, the clerk, how many copies of GTA V are sitting on the shelf. So when you ask the clerk how many copies are sitting, the clerk 
is supposed to write down the exact number. So it could be like 20, it could be 30, it could be 100. Instead, the clerk is a malicious piece of shit. And what the clerk decided to do was instead of writing the number, the clerk erased the final instruction I gave you to come home and tell me how many copies and told you, hey, go to the pharmacy section and wait for the guy to give you instructions there. Now, you're a humble, honest person. You'll look at that sheet and be like, ah, Let's go to the pharmacy section. See, this is a arms race, if you will, when it comes to fighting these vulnerabilities. Now, normally, if you wanted to fight this, one of the ways you could have done it is when I gave you the instructions on the fourth section, I could have told you, hey, clerk, I give me, I'm giving you two digits. You give me two digits and that's it. I don't care if it's over 99, okay? If it's like 30 copies, you're only allowed to write 30. So the clerk literally cannot erase the final instruction and start to alter things. So in this layman's explanation, when we apply it back to computers, what the clerk is doing, the evil one, is trying to launch shellcode on your system or trying to take advantage of vulnerabilities within your programming, within your instructions. And that's kind of one thing that you're seeing over here in a very layman's explanation. If you want to get really nitty dirty with this, there's a lot of instructional material you can read about shellcodes itself. Again, I'm just trying to make it as easy to understand for the average person. If you're somebody out there that knows way more about this than I do, which absolutely is the case, you can come on in and explain this in a better way in the comment section below. But again, I'm trying to make this as accessible for everybody learning. Now that said though, the way that the shell code in this system works is basically by taking advantage of emojis. Now emojis for a lot of people, if you look into this entire list, these are all the kinds of different emojis we have on our system. So smiling faces, you know, faces with affection on them, faces with angels, if you will, tons of different emojis. Emojis are not picture files embedded into a computer. In fact, if anything, they're just Unicode prompts. They're just Unicode uh, letters, Unicode um, slots, if you will, that all contain different identifiers for emojis. So this code U plus 1F600 could spawn all these different emojis depending on the type that you have, depending on what device and operating system that you're using. So for instance, when you put the pregnant man emoji on your iPhone device, well, the Google people will see it like this. WhatsApp users will see it like that. Twitter users will see it like this. Underneath this image is a Unicode prompt, a Unicode script that's sent. And that script is interpreted differently depending on what devices you use. So if you have an iOS device, you'll see this prego man. If you have a Facebook device or a Facebook system or the Facebook chat client, you'll see this prego device. It's different depending on what devices you use. And a lot of these reasons can be up to different themes on an operating system or different licensing. Like some emojis are literally licensed by these companies. So again, that's where the variants occur. Unicode is a way for us to communicate between devices really, really easily, really, really effectively. Um, Cross-platform, if you will. And remember, there's new emojis every goddamn year, every month, if you will, too. So we're constantly adding to the lexicon. Now, going back to how emojis can actually hack you now that you've learned all of this. Well, these researchers found out ways to basically create RISC-V shellcode. Now, of course, why would anybody write any of these constrained shellcodes? Code that you wrote in the target's memory, that gives you some power, so again, popping a shell. If you can pop a shell and run arbitrary code, so depending on the ISA that you're using, these emojis can be interpreted a little differently. And eventually, it came out by these researchers that the actual way that they were able to achieve any of this was through a very, very specific method. Eventually, because of different instruction sets, the way this is interpreted between x86, ARM and RISC-V is a bit different amongst each device. But these developers, these researchers found that effectively by going through, they were able to actually write emojis or write code, write shell code using some of these emoji chains. And it came out that some of the emoji chains looked a lot like this. Like here's something they'd list as nope sled, all right, with this special like sled emoji. And of course, what we can do with the nope sled. And of course, they keep on adding emojis. And eventually they reach a point where these emoji chains eventually also come up and are interpreted as executable code. So again, this emoji chain or emoji chain similar to this can be used to generate shell code, spawn a shell, and do some really wacky shit all through the power of emojis. But the reason why we all can just sit down and laugh at this is that it's really not going to happen to you or anybody. So let's explain how this works. Effectively, if you were to do this in the real world, you would need to find a vulnerability. 
Now, once you find the vulnerability, before you get to it, you need to basically go through a filter, right? So when you're sending a payload at this point, you're only able to send things like letters or various digits. And the payloads are only made of those letters and digits. So for this emoji attack to ever theoretically work, that's that, that writable emoji that they made, you have to go through a filter that literally only reads emojis. That's it. Which at the moment does not exist at all. So again, to exploit it, you go through that emoji only input and then you create this emoji only shell code that will then spawn a shell that you can do some really wild stuff with. And again, going back to it, what's the chances anybody is only going to have a system that only reads and writes and processes emojis? Chances are pretty little. Like I would even wager the most TikTok heavy, like crazy social media types at least use letters and numbers. Okay. Using only emojis is downright dastardly. Now, the most important part about these systems and understanding some of these hacks is that even though they, they sound very impossible from a real world perspective, knowing them right now means that they are not going to come across us and not going to like surprise us down the road. The reason is we know that this is a possibility that could happen. So a lot of the teams responsible for securing systems, the red and blue teams of the world, can find ways to apply this technique itself and basically kind of kind of avoid it going on down the road if this ever becomes the computer path that we go down risk five or really any instruction set that's capable of being affected this way so of course ladies and gentlemen some software did in fact have a real hard time doing this so even if you can hack the system not all computers and software can properly support them They've literally showed in their findings that when it came down to it, there was software like Adobe Acrobat Reader, which gave you major glitches. VLC gave you glitches on their specific MKV files. And in fact, one terminal, XFCE4, gave so much slowness that they had to actually note it down. And when it came to Windows, bitch, that motherfucker gave that BSOD, blue screen of death, Firefox... You're done, baby. See, even when you can get access to it, even when you can launch some nastiness, emojis are a troubled vice to work with, is all I can say. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a wild world to get into. Yes, can you technically hack people with just emojis? Absolutely. Is it a wild, wor wild world we live in? Absolutely. Is it something you have to be scared of? No, probably not, unless you're part of the 0.001%, possibly. Possibly possibly uh, vulnerable to this. So we can all laugh at it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.